a PhD with Professor Dunkirk a few years ago, and now she's back home to beautiful Beirut. So uh, without further delay, the first talk, God uh, nice, I will give that on stochastic modeling. Yeah. And Please. simulation of near full ground motions, <laughs> long title, for use in performance-based earthquake engineering. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And um, before starting, I want to acknowledge the work of uh, my master's student, Tiara Dawood, and uh, collaboration with uh, Marco Brocardo, who was also a PhD student at Berkeley and who's now uh, a postdoctoral fellow at uh, ETH Zurich. Um, I'll quickly go over the motivation um, uh, and uh, the fact that near fall ground motions have characteristics that are different from far field ground motions, mostly um, known for the rupture directivity effect and um, the flick step. And these effects are not yet properly represented in uh, modern codes and uh, in current uh, GMPEs. Um, our model mostly captures the rupture directivity effect, it can also incorporate the fling step. Um, and uh, these rupture directivity effects depend on the activity parameters, which I'll uh, introduce here. These are, um, they describe the geometry of um, uh, the rupture relative to the site. So the directivity parameters that we use are uh, the length S and the width D of the rupture between the uh, hypocenter and the site, uh, as well as the uh, horizontal and vertical angles theta and uh, phi between the hypocenter um, to site direction and the rupture plane. And um, S and theta are used for strike slip faults, while D and phi uh, are used for dip slip faults. So this is just to introduce you to the uh, terminology that we're using. So there have been ongoing efforts to understand, model, and simulate near fall ground motions and their, uh, their effects on the response of, uh, uh, of structures, uh, including bridges and long period structures. Um, did the mic stop? The mic is, yeah. 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 Um, I Hello? Okay, yeah. it's working. Um, and um, these efforts include uh, a procedure for simulation of near fall ground motions that um, uh, I developed under the supervision of uh, Armin as part of my PhD. And the input required is the type of the fold, the magnitude, the distance to the fold structure, um, uh, the uh, VS30 of the site, as well as uh, the directivity parameters, S or D and theta or phi, depending on the type of faulting. Um, the model accounts for the directivity effect. It produces a relative number of pulse-like and non-pulse-like ground motions consistent with recorded motions. Uh, and it's useful to generate synthetic uh, ground motions for seismic assessment studies, for example. Um, now, um, our model has some limitations. Um, uh, the simulations tend to have a sharper peak uh, of the response spectrum. They tend to overestimate spectral amplitudes at long periods, although this may be due to uh, the fact that the GMPEs actually underestimate the uh, spectral amplitudes at the longer period, or a mix of the two. Um, uh, the simulations also tend to uh, overestimate correlations between spectral amplitudes at different periods. And this becomes important if you have um, higher mode effects. So these are uh, the examples of uh, the correlations between spectral periods, I don't know if the colors are clear, uh, for recorded motions and for uh, simulated motions. And you can see that our simulations tend to um, overestimate the, the correlations. So um, uh, as uh, part of the scope of the current project is uh, to improve the formulation of our model, to try to fix these, uh, these problems, uh, to reduce the high correlations between the spectral periods, um, and also to explore an alternative uh, method and more efficient method of fitting the uh, modulating function. Um, uh, another um, um, problem or like um, uh, thing to address in the current scope of the project is that the generated time series due to the filtering that we're um, applying was resulting in a very long, um, uh, almost zero paths before and after the simulated signal. Okay, and this is not practical for engineering applications. Uh, so um, we're going to remove these um, and um, Yet another uh, motivation for the current project is that uh, the information that you have for seismic assessment studies is usually uh, what is the fault that is contributing to the hazard, what's the type of faulting, its magnitude, its distance to our site. But usually don't have 
uh, information about the location of the hypocenter and about the directivity parameters. So we're adding um, uh, a layer into our simulations, which is to um, provide the users with the dis proper distribution of these directivity parameters with knowledge of only the fault contributing to the hazard and its um, uh, type of uh, its type and its magnitude and uh, distance to the to the site. <coughs> Um, uh, so this is part B of um, the scope, which is to reduce the size of the generated time series and generate ground motions for uh, randomized hypocenter locations. Um, two other um, uh, um, parts, scopes um, of the project, which I'll quickly go over, are um, validation of the, of the model uh, by comparing uh, nonlinear time history responses of um, uh, bridges subjected to recorded and simulated motions. Um, and possibly the incorporation of the simulations in GMSM uh, procedures. And um, I'm targeting these uh, parts of the scope uh, in collaboration with um, a group at UC Irvine. Uh, so the outline of my presentation, I'll briefly review um, the uh, existing model that we had, which is uh, the simulations of near full ground motions for specified F, M, Z-Tor, or Rob, VS30, and directivity parameters. Um, then I'll briefly go over the reduction of the time series size um, and um, uh, the ex uh, extension of the simulation procedure when we only know the specified site and fault. Um, and this is done by randomizing, as I said, the uh, rupture geometry and the hypocenter location. Um, we can also do simulations to compare with the NGA was two models, where again the, rup the uh, rupture directivity parameters or not part of the uh, GMPEs. Um, and finally, I'll uh, give some preliminary results from using an improved stochastic model. Um, so uh, our, uh, our existing model is a site-based stochastic model um, in two orthogonal directions, and it accounts for both pulse-like and non-pulse-like motions. Um, for uh, the pulse-like ground motion model, it is in terms of 19 physically meaningful parameters that um, uh, consist of uh, um, both intensity parameters, such as IRS intensity, pulse amplitude, duration parameters, and frequency content parameters. So they're able to capture the most important uh, physical characteristics of a uh, ground motion. Uh, similarly, for uh, non-pulse-like motions, we model them using um, uh, 14 physically, uh, uh, using a model in terms of 14 physically meaningful parameters. And uh, the simulation procedure, this is the input required. With this input, the first step is to uh, determine whether the ground motion that is going to be simulated will be pulse-like or non-pulse-like. And uh, this is uh, done uh, using the pulse probability model developed by uh, Shahi and Baker. Then if we want to simulate a pulse-like motion, then we use um, predictive relations for pulse-like parameters, empirical predictive relations that we've developed uh, to generate the model parameters, we plug them into our model to get the synthetic um, time series. And I'm sorry, I guess the uh, graphics here are not very clear. Um, and we do the same if we have a non-pulse-like uh, ground motion to simulate. Um, now, um, just a quick um, uh, uh, overview of the truncation and baseline correction that we're uh, implementing now. Uh, the simulated motions are truncated before and after the strong motion signal where the displacement amplitudes drop below 0.2 centimeters and below 1% of the peak ground displacement in both components of ground motion. So this is the originally simulated motion. The first step is to truncate it. The truncation results in non-zero displacements at the end of the motion, which is um, not realistic. So we apply a baseline correction. We fit a fifth order polynomial and we remove it from the signal to end up with the uh, yellow signal, which is very similar to the original one. Um, uh, and this fixes the problem of truncation, bringing the displacement back back to zero. So, uh, and you can look at the effect of um, this truncation and baseline correction. It does not really affect the uh, response spectra. Um, now, if you want to generate synthetic ground motions for a specified site with known VS30 and a specified fault with known a type of faulting and, and magnitude, we're going to randomize the rupture geometry and the hypocenter location because these are unknown um, to start with. Oh. 
Okay, so this is uh, incompatible with the slides that I have. Um, so um, I guess I'll hopefully use these slides. So the first step is um, knowing the uh, fault characteristics. So the magnitude of the uh, rupture, the type of the rupture, and the geometry of the fault. Okay, we want to generate um, our ruptures, uh, rupture plane coordinates, and hypocenter location. So um, first to describe the rupture, we generate the uh, depth to the top of rupture. And um, we, for now, we use this simple model by Campbell and all, which is magnitude dependent to determine the depth to the top of the rupture. Uh, then the next step is knowing the type of faulting and the magnitude. Sorry, this is all uh, messed up. Uh, we use the Wells and Coppersmith relation to estimate the rupture dimensions. So. Um, uh, we estimate the fault rupture uh, length and uh, width using uh, these relations. So these are the mean and standard deviations. And we generate the um, uh, rupture length and rupture width as uh, correlated random variables. Okay. So um, once we uh, have the uh, rupture dimensions and the depth to the top of the rupture, we can uh, then generate um, uh, the uh, rupture plane. And we sample it uniformly from the full um, uh, full uh, fault uh, surface. Um, and these are examples of randomized ruptures. This is the, the input that we provide. And these are three examples of um, um, uh, rupture realization. So the blue box is the fault geometry. And the um, uh, red uh, rectangles are three rupture realizations that are consistent with uh, this input and consistent with the probability distributions that I uh, presented earlier on. Um, the next step is having the um, uh, the full structure to determine the location of the hypocenter. So for that, uh, we use a model by Mayendal to determine the uh, uh, hypocenter location along strike, um, and it is sampled from uh, a truncated normal distribution. Uh, as well as the uh, hypocenter distribution down dip, which uh, is sampled from a uh, Weibel or gamma distribution, depending on whether it's a strike slip fault or uh, a dip slip fault. Um, so these are some examples of randomized hypocenter locations for um, uh, uh, three scenarios. So in this case, uh, the I'm taking the same full rupture plane, the, f uh, uh, the same rupture plane, which is the red uh, rectangle, and these um, um, uh, green uh, stars are three different locations of hypocenters that are consistent with um, uh, the Mai and all model and that are consistent with um, this uh, input. Okay. So um, with that, we now have all of the information um, uh, to uh, so uh, with the location, with the rupture dimension, rupture geometry, hypocenter location, and site location, we can actually calculate our rup. S, D, theta, and phi, which are the directivity parameters. So we can calculate uh, these input parameters. Okay, and uh, then we can go through our simulation procedure again, where uh, F, M, and uh, VS30 are provided, but uh, Z, Tor, or Rup, S, or D, theta, or phi were simulated uh, given this input parameter, and we can go through the simulation procedure um, as uh, explained uh, earlier on. Okay, uh, I'll take the slide. Um, uh, we can also generate near full ground motions for comparison with the NGA was two models, which uh, do not include directivity parameters as their input. So again, here um, uh, we're going to randomize the rupture geometry and the hypocenter location, but we're also going to randomize the site location by uh, sampling sites uniformly at a distance r up from the fault rupture surface. And um, these are the so-called race tracks. So uh, here we have three different realizations of, uh, with variable rupture length, hypocenter locations, as well as site locations. So this can be re repeated many times in a Monte Carlo simulation framework to get um, uh, the um, uh, corresponding distribution of uh, the directivity parameters for uh, the desired input. Um, and then from the geometry, we can calculate S or D and theta or phi. Um, and uh, this is an example showing uh, 600 of our simulations for uh, this input scenario. 
And the comparison with the NGA was two GMPEs. Uh, so here I'm showing in colors the five different uh, GMPEs. Uh, the dashed line is the median spectrum of our pulse-like motions. The solid line is that of our non-pulse-like motions. So you can see that the pulse-like motions have larger amplitudes at the longer periods. Um, the uh, uh, percentage of pulse-like motions is 20% out of the total simulations, which is consistent with uh, the observed um, uh, ratio and recorded motions. And um, if we compare um, the uh, global median of our simulations, of our 600 simulations with the NGA West GMPs, we see that it falls within the range of, uh, that is spanned by the five NGA West GMPs. Okay, so this is a validation that we're uh, capturing the um, uh, recorded ground motion levels. Uh, also, at most periods, our simulated motions fall within the median plus minus one sigma levels predicted by the NGA West 2 models. Um, finally, the last part is the improved stochastic model, which consists of a moderated and filtered white noise process defined via a spectral representation. So uh, what we're proposing is to um, uh, replace the moderated filtered white noise model that we've been using with an improved version. Uh, the improved version includes a non-parametric uh, non moderating function. Um, it has a larger number of parameters, but it's simpler to fit. Um, uh, the filter is defined in the frequency domain, um, which makes the fitting of the filter parameters uh, uh, more direct, directly on the evolutionary power spectral density, instead of having the uh, making use of proxies such that the cumulative count of zero level up crossings or the cumulative count of positive minima and uh, negative maxima. Uh, we're still exploring several uh, alternative filter functions to see which one um, gives us the, um, uh, the best performance with the minimum number of parameters. And uh, the application of the high pass filter um, becomes a lot easier because it's directly applied on the uh, EPST. Um, here I'll uh, just illustrate the, the moderating function. So this is a recorded motion, and this is its cumulative areas intensity variation over time. And um, when we are using a parametric function, uh, this is the type of fitting that we are obtaining. So we were kind of capturing the overall variation, the um, maximum, the, the level at, uh, at the end, and this is the fitted moderating function. Now in this case, we have two kind of two peaks in the um, amplitude of the recorded motion. So um, now with the non-parametric uh, non moderating function, we're, uh, what we're doing is we're uh, capturing the times at different points of percent of areas intensity and simply fitting a spline between these points. So we're making use of a larger number of points, but we're able to capture uh, these two peaks in the amplitudes and the fitting of the moderating function in this case is actually a lot easier, a lot um, faster to obtain. Um, these are some preliminary results um, comparing the response spectra of recorded motions and simulated motions using fitted model parameters. And uh, we are able to get a good match of the mean and median uh, spectra. Uh, here the six uh, subplots are uh, exploring six different versions of the filter function. So this is still work in progress. But all of these alternatives um, are actually fitting the response spectral levels quite well. And what we're interested in was also the uh, correlations. And again here, even with a simple filter function, we're able to capture the correlations between spectral periods um, better than what we were uh, in the original model. Um. So um, to end um, uh, with the work in progress and future work, um, so um, for the synthetic new foreground motions being simulated for specific site and um, uh, fault, um, what we're working on right now is also randomizing the Z-Tor. We've been using a deterministic um, uh, function for now, and we want to generate it uh, and simulate it jointly with the rupture dimensions. Um, we also want to randomize the site location for non-vertical faults, which is a slightly more difficult geometric problem. And uh, finally, for the improved stochastic model, we're um, finalizing the model formulation. We need to confirm that the improvement that we've seen um, uh, extends to pulse-like near-fall ground motions. We haven't included the pulse in the results I've shown so far. 
um, and we uh, still need to develop predictive relations and possibly uh, combine near fault and far field simulations in a simple uh, in a single um, uh, framework. Thank you. I'm sorry about the uh, problems with the. Models, which like there are five different directivity models that were also developed part of uh, the um, uh, peer funding, but um, there were there was no consensus, and this is still work in progress as to how to incorporate them into the GMPEs. So these are just the 2014 GMPEs with no uh, directivity parameters as uh, input, at least to my knowledge. Uh, have you compared this with data? Are you, do you have? I don't know if I may have missed it. Uh, just comparison to actual measured recorded ground motions? So the fitting system? itself is done on the recorded ground motions. Oh, you've got and then what, um, I, I haven't shown it here, but um, we've done checks in terms of rep, um, uh, simulating um, ground motions using fitted model parameters and comparing them with their recorded counterparts. Uh, but I don't have the figures here. So, so as part of the uh, fitting uh, procedure and validation procedure, we've compared uh, simulations using fitted parameters to the recorded motions that were used to fit those parameters. Okay. Oh. And one last question yes. is, are you taking, are you looking at directionality at all? Because I've seen you're doing everything in the fault normal, fault parallel. Uh, so no, we're not it doing it in the fault normal, fault parallel. So let me go back to the, um, motion model um, I quickly skipped through this so for the pulse like model um, uh, we formulated in the direction of the largest pulse and the corresponding orthogonal direction and uh, as part of my PhD I looked at um, a model to predict the direction of the largest pulse relative to the strike of the fault so it tends to be mostly the um, um, uh, in default normal or strike normal direction, but there is variability in uh, the actual direction of the largest pulse relative to the strike of the fault. So this is taken into consideration in the simulations. Um, for the non-pulse-like motions, the model is formulated in the major intermediate uh, directions, and there's a tendency here for this to be uh, randomly oriented relative to the strike of the fault. So there is not much directionality um, uh, in uh, the major and intermediate um, principal directions. So you're doing a 2D kind of... Yes, and, and so the directionality is taken into consideration. Okay. Any, any other questions? Um, I, I have a question. So you yes. use iris intensity. Did yes. you try something like CAV? Um, I did. Um, at some point uh, when I was uh, still a student, I uh, looked at the, uh, uh, like replacing RS intensity with, uh, with CAV, with CAV. Um, and um, the results were um, uh, more or less similar. I think one can capture uh, uh, like the intermediate uh, periods better than the other. But overall, there wasn't much difference. But uh, it can be further investigated. So it may depend on the application uh, also. Just when you square it, the, the, the big number become bigger and yeah. the small number become very small. Yeah. Take the absolute velocity. Okay, any, any other comments, questions? Okay, thanks, Maisa. Thank you. So the second uh, talk. Uh,